Uh, okay. Right, so here's my first slide. Do you see the tiny artifacts on the left-hand side of the screen? So these are known as the Ketef Hinom Silver Scrolls, and they're each about the size of a cigarette. And they were discovered just outside the old city of Jerusalem in 1979 by Dr. Gabriel Barkai and his archeological team. And they're inscribed in Paleo Hebrew and the experts managed to decipher what you see on the, you can see it on the right side of the screen. So if you look at the last four lines, you can see you can, uh, those words with which the, we've just been talking about, just reading from here, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may the Lord shine his face. So those are the words of the ironic blessing found in number six. The scrolls have been dated to the seventh century BC. That makes this the oldest surviving biblical inscription in existence today. Now, it was a discovery that caused quite a stir in the academic world because it seems to discredit the idea of liberal scholars that the Torah was written at a late date. In fact, it points to a much earlier time of composition and helps to affirm mosaic authorship. Hmm. But the discovery has another significance. It surely cannot be coincidence that the oldest biblical inscription found to date is focused on the idea of blessing. That seems to signify a fundamental truth that the purpose of God's choosing the Hebrew nation was intrinsically bound up with the idea of blessing. We'll return later to the words of that ancient blessing, but for the moment, we'll go back and we'll look at the first words that God spoke to Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, where we find this same idea is absolutely central. So if we have a look at the words on the left from Gen Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, they're very familiar words, very famous and very well known. God says to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So when God made these incredible promises to Abraham, he created a new way of looking at relationship with him. It would be a relationship infused with holiness through an unconditional everlasting covenant. And the words also confer this remarkable, beautiful paradigm of blessing. And the matter of blessing is clearly something which is of great importance in the Lord's eyes. We can see from these words that I've listed some things here on the right side. God has intentionally, inextricably linked himself with the Jewish people, the people of Israel, and we call them the Jewish people today but the people of Israel. This is a people he has created specifically for the purpose of blessing. Also, we see there's always going to be a reaction to them. We can't stand on, we have, uh, there won't be anything neutral. It will be either positive or negative. We see that loving him and loving them are two sides of the same coin. And clearly, it's impossible to truly love him while failing to love them. Yeah. Now, just looking, focusing in on Genesis 12, verse 3a. I will bless those who bless you. So we have this it's very um, beautiful promise. And the word bless is the Hebrew word barach. And it's related to the word bracha, which means blessing. And that's a special favor, benefit. Right from the beginning in Genesis, we see that God wanted to bless. He wants to bestow his gifts freely, um, undeservedly. Now, it's the second part that I really would like to make a couple of points about. I will curse him who curses you. 
Uh, that's the usual English translation. And it's very neat the way it comes across and very easy to remember. But actually, there are two different words for curse here. And the first one is kalal, which means to treat lightly, to treat with contempt um, and to curse. And, but the second verb means is ara, and that means to execrate, to express mm -hmm. great loathing for, to bitterly curse. So we see uh, when we read it that way, we get a very different idea. Um, those who bless the descendants of Abraham will themselves receive happiness, goodness, prosperity. But for those who treat the Jewish people lightly, even lightly, always contempt, much less intentionally treat them badly, um, only great distress, evil, and the removing of blessing await. So that really highlights uh, the seriousness of these promises to Abraham. Now, this whole duality of blessing and curse is woven into the scriptures, and the Jewish people themselves are the first ones who are subject to this duality. And we see this most especially, uh, especially in the list of blessings and curses. We find it in Leviticus 26, and we find it reiterated in Deuteronomy 28. I'm sure you've all read it. It is a very, very sobering and alarming and terrifying chapter. Um, God gives the Israelites a list of amazing blessings that await them should they choose to be obedient to him. But he also lists many curses that would come upon them should they choose otherwise, and including eventual dispersion from the land of promise. So we can have a look at a few things, poverty, pestilence, the, the land of desert, defeated in war, unhappiness, wives taken, ravished, children sold to slaves, left des destitution, and considered to be the lowest of citizens, religious freedom abolished, hunger, thirst, and nakedness. And you know, we've seen all these things come to pass in the history of the Jewish people. Uh, very, and also exile is the ultimate, the ultimate um, really curse that's going to come upon them. But as we read further in the scriptures, we find repeated promises from God that he would not forsake his people. He would remember them. He would bring them back to the land and he would pour out his blessings upon them. And the prophet Ezekiel makes it clear this would be solely an act of love and mercy on God's part. And it wouldn't just benefit Israel, but all the nations of the earth. So, unfortunately, because the Jewish people are humanity writ large, their story is, they're just telling the story of humanity and they made their wrong choices. Uh, they were disobedient. History tells us that exile became part of their experience. And we get some glimpses of what the feeling of the exiles was. Psalm 137, one of the Psalms, yes, when the Jews were exiled to Babylon, they recorded their lament. It's one of the most plaintive and poignant uh, songs ever written. So they say, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps on the willows in the midst thereof. They asked, how can we sing the songs of the Lord in a foreign land? Very beautiful psalm. But the Israelites did return from their Babylonian exile. Now, almost 26, how, did the, how were the Jews going to behave in, Israel, in exile? And here, enter Jeremiah, because the words he spoke to them, the words he wrote to them, um, with this prospect of exile, has, has sustained the Jewish people, um, not just in the 70 years in Babylon, but throughout a much longer exile that is come to, going to come to them later. Um, so he wrote this letter to his fellow countrymen and women who had been sent to this exile in Babylon. 
they'd seen their beautiful temple destroyed, the central symbol of their nation and the sign God was in their midst. They'd witnessed Jerusalem in flames. And from the psalm, we understand their despondency. Now, Jeremiah isn't usually known for his positive psychology. And he'd warned the people of Judah that this so many times this is going to happen. Mend your ways. But he doesn't say, I told you so. What he wrote to them was instrumental in changing the course of Jewish history, perhaps even in an indirect way of Western civilization as a whole. And that's what this is what he wrote. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives to your sons and give your daughters husbands, so they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. Now, there was only a unique configuration of ideas that made Jeremiah's vision possible. First idea, I've got them listed over. The first idea was monotheism. If God was everywhere, if there was one universal deity, he could be accessed anywhere, even by the rivers of Babylon. Secondly, belief in the sovereignty of the God of history over all other powers. Until then, if a people were conquered, it meant the defeat of a nation and its God. For the first time in Jeremiah's retelling of the Babylonian conquest of Israel, the defeat of a nation is understood as being accomplished by its God. God was still supreme. Babylon was merely the instrument of his wrath. A people could suffer defeat and keep its faith intact. Thirdly, the belief that God also kept his faith intact. He would not break his word, his covenant with Israel, however many times Israel broke its covenant with him. He could be relied on to honor his promise, just as he had when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. In the future, as in the past, he would bring his people back to their land. So Jeremiah, uh, like all the prophets, was ultimately a voice of hope. And his letter became the basis of Jewish hope for survival in the diaspora for 26 centuries until today. Um, and the diaspora has been difficult, heartbreaking, tenuous, but the Jewish people have survived. Now, the Jewish people returned from Babylon, but their most long and difficult exile was ahead. After the Romans expelled them and carried them into captivity, they were scattered to the four corners and subject to persecution and wandering, just as Deuteronomy had foretold. Now the Hebrew term galut, which I have here, is, is the Jewish, it means exile. It's the Jewish conception of the condition and feelings of a nation uprooted from its homeland and sub subjected to oppressive foreign rule. And that sense of exile was expressed throughout the centuries as the Jewish people wrestled with what had happened to them. It was um, expressed by this feeling of terrible alienation in the countries of diaspora. They could never feel at home there. It was the yearning for the national and political past, for everything they had in Zion. And it was persistent questioning of the causes, the meaning and the purpose of the exile. So the greatest minds of the Jewish nation were grappling with all these things. They knew the Jewish nation had become different from other nations of the world through its experience of suffering and humiliation and detachment from the rest of society for generation after generation. Now, um, I think that um, this yearning for Zion, this yearning for um, uh, Jerusalem and the, and the holy temple, it was expressed in many different ways over the centuries. One of the most wonderful voices is the voice of Yehuda Halevi. And he was a Jewish physician and a poet and a philosopher. And he lived in the golden age of Spain in the 12th century. And he's considered one of the greatest Hebrew poets. And he wrote both secular poems and also religious poems. 
And the religious poems are just filled with this heartbroken yearning for the land of Israel. And um, he actually managed to make a trip to Israel uh, in 1141 to the Holy Land. Uh, at that point, it was the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem, um, but he died shortly after arriving there. But this is one of his poems, which expresses so beautifully the longing of the Jewish people for Israel. Um, and it, my heart is in the East, he writes, my heart is in the East and I in the uttermost West. How can I find savor in food? How shall it be sweet to me? How shall I render my vows and my bonds while yet Zion lieth beneath the fetter of Edom and I in Arab chains? A light thing would it seem to me to leave all the good things of Spain, seeing how precious in my eyes to behold the dust of the desolate sanctuary. So that's one of his um, beautiful expressions of longing for Zion. Now, but um, as a failure, uh, as a result of their failure to keep the covenant um, and their subsequent exile, the Jews lived in is a Europe for nearly 2,000 years. They, they labored, they suffered, they shed their blood. Um, they contributed in the nations where they found themselves, the host nations. They maintained their spiritual life and their faith. And quite often we find they rose to very prominent positions, they were a source of blessing were in the nations where they were, when they were accepted. Um, but what we're asking here now is, how did that Abraham uh, promise of blessing and curse play out with other nations throughout history? Do we find that their destinies were also impacted by the ancient promise of blessing and curse that was given to Abraham? That depended on the treatment of the Jewish people. So when we look through that lens, how did they treat Israel? This clearly suggests that those empires and nations that treated the Jews well have historically prospered, while those who harmed and attempted to destroy the Jews have met disaster or even destruction. And that is the visible, verifiable outworking of the Lord's promises to Abraham. So it's a cycle that we see throughout biblical history and post-biblical. And I put up a list of different nations here and we could go through each of them, but um, I'm sure you know quite a lot about, it. well, Egypt, that's not, that's easy, Babylon and Syria. We can see these nations, the empires vanish. Uh, Rome, which was one of the greatest empires ever, uh, fell apart the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and of course the Jewish people, this little nation they persecuted, exists to this day. Spain, we know 1492, Spain was a very, very proud empire. Well, they've diminished so greatly. Britain uh, really prospered when she led in the Jews and had a Jewish prime minister, the Israeli, and there was a great restoration of Christians, and they were the, the, the author of the Balfour Declaration, um, but sadly, the, the Britain, you know, played that role in betrayal and her empire has diminished somewhat. Germany, we need to say no more. Russia, those terrible, oh, even Poland. Um, Poland uh, has a fascinating history. Uh, and Poland opened its borders to the Jewish people for centuries. They really found a homeland there. But then in the uh, 20th century, there was uh, anti-Semitism developed on quite a large scale. And uh, we see a very tragic history for Poland in the uh, 20th century, perhaps as a result. So what I'll just mention here is some, a really extraordinary thing, uh, going back to Russia and its pogroms. Well, so um, Russia in 1917, the Bolshevik revolution, the communist government established, Stalin came to power in uh, the 1920s. Uh, really a, a terrible, terrible dictator who caused um, great suffering to all his people, not just the Jewish people. And on February 28, 1953, he suffered a stroke. And curiously, it was on the same day as the Jewish holiday of Purim, the festival that commemorates the salvation of the Jewish people in ancient Persia, Purim's plot to destroy and kill them. 
It was also on the same day that deportations to Siberia of more than 1 million Jews from Moscow alone and millions more from other parts of the Soviet Union were to begin. So really an extraordinary intervention uh, that really um, demonstrates God's power and his truth, the truth of his word. So this biblical admonition uh, that uh, was given to Abraham, it's not empty words on an ancient scroll, it's vital. It remains in force and its consequences have been felt in our own lifetimes. And in fact, how nations and individuals treat Israel has shaped history and still does. It's Israel, which is the key to our world's history. Okay, so <laughs> we know that the unbelievable came about in 1947. Herzl's vision became a reality. A nation was born in a single day, according to the divine promise. But the restoration, the return and restoration, as we know, was not without so many sacrifices along the way. Now, God also promised in his word to make Israel a light to the nations. In Isaiah 49, 6, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So the Hebrew word for light here is or, um, and it means the light of godly instruction, life, happiness, prosperity. In short, it means blessing. And Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion spoke often of the state of Israel as a moral and social beacon to the whole world. And the selection of the menorah the, um, as the emblem of the state was derived. Uh, if you've been to, a lot of you have been to Israel, I think we have this wonderful menorah outside the Knesset. So it was derived specifically from those words in Isaiah 49. And with the rebirth of the state, God began the amazing process of making Israel a light to the nations in every sense of the word. So, um, tikkun olam, this is a Jewish phrase, it means repairing the world. And prior to Israel's declaration of statehood in 48, the area called Palestine had for centuries been a desolate, backward, third world part of the Turkish Empire. Today, a mere 73 years later, it's a thriving first world nation, the only democracy in the Middle East. Today, Israel is a global venture capital superpower, creator of a special humanitarian and emergency aid unit, which has carried out operations in Kenya, Albania, Mexico, Congo, Haiti, Japan, Nepal, to Syrian refugees, assisted Christians and Yazidis, um, to name only a few of the uh, operations. They've helped alleviate hunger, disease, and poverty in developing countries. This is little known. They facilitated facilitated building projects in the Gaza Strip, including clinics, schools, infrastructure, and even entire neighborhoods. Uh, there, I've got that twice. Um, actually, I could put in so many more things. Israel is a world leader in agricultural innovation and medicine, leading advances in the areas of cyber warfare, technology, and communications. Israelis are teaching the French how to make wine and the Belgians how to make chocolate. <laughs> so, this is what the Israelis, they, are, you know, they have this mission. They, they want to um, uh, uh, bring blessing to the world. So, um, yeah. Now, what is the secret to Israel's success? I, and, you know, a lot of great minds have pondered this. How, how have they managed to achieve so much in such a short time while they besieged on every side? died in fighting wars uh, on a regular basis. So one expert gives credit to the skills Israelis learn while in mandatory army service, where they must solve complex problems quickly and with limited resources. Others say the security system demands innovation and requires high levels of research. While some attribute Israel's remarkable success to just plain Israeli chutzpah or maybe you know, all together, <laughs> they contribute. 
but some are beginning to recognize, would that all in the media would recognize, that Israel's foundational belief in a God who created every man in his own image undergirds their respect for human life and fuels that innovative spirit. And Bible believers would say it's a fulfillment of God's promise to bless Israel. So truly God is blessing Israel. God is the one that keeps her. It's only God that holds this little nation together. Uh, and even though the people there are facing issues of violence, terror, threats of war, and undue intervention by the international community, as all the eyes of the world are on Jerusalem. Uh, <laughs> and many feel uh, competent to tell the Israelis what to do. Uh, all the while, they are fighting for their very existence. Um, now, what we do see is that um, we're warned in the scriptures that uh, in the latter day, well, throughout uh, history, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men have loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were e evil. And um, what we see is that uh, Israel has faced um, a great opposition from uh, the people of Islam. Now, some do see that today's um, Arab-Israeli conflict is rooted in biblical history. If we read the book of uh, Genesis carefully, we see the great threat to humanity is sibling rivalry. It goes back to Cain and Abel, we see Jacob and Esau, we see Isaac, Ishmael, we see Joseph and his brothers. Um, so there is an ancient enmity between the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, and there is a lingering offense of Israel's chosenness. This whole issue of Israel's chosenness is a huge uh, theological issue that would be really good to take up at some time uh, because Israel has been chosen not to exalt her. Israel has been chosen to bless the nations because God desires to bless them. But um, it's very hard for, especially for the Arab people to look past the offense, that, that ancient offense, that ancient um, a conflict, enmity that lies between them. So today, Islam repeatedly reviles the Jewish state and Israel is criticized in a very hateful way. Um, uh, now, this return of the Jews to Palestine, that it would prove a blessing, not only to themselves, but also to their Arab neighbors, was envisaged by the Emir Faisal, the great leader of the uh, Jewish uh, Arab peoples at the peace conference following World War I. And this is what he, he said. We Arabs look with deeper sympathy on the Zionist movement. We wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. I look forward and my people with me look forward to a future in which we will help you and you will help us so that the countries in which we are mutually interested may once again take their places in the community of civilized people in the world. Sadly, this did not continue. And we know there were um, reckless leaders follow, um, the, an extremist Arab nationalism de developed, which still continues. And um, the Arabs have made all out war against Israel on many occasions. There have been intifadas, there have been suicide bombings, there have been rocket attacks. But we have a great hope. And I have here a picture, in, if we go back to Genesis, we find that there was Reconcile. We hear we Isaac and Ishmael meet to bury Abraham. We find at the end of Joseph's story there was reconciliation with his brothers. So we have great hope from the scriptures. And um, there is one um, a Jewish philosopher has described uh, his hope for the whole region. Uh, Jewish philosopher described his whole his hope for the whole region, and that is uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel. And I believe Sharon has um, mentioned him to you in the past. So this is what he, he wrote. Um, he has this vision for the future of the Middle East. And we, I won't go all the way through it, but he sees this, um, in, if there was peace, he can, see, he can see communications between Haifa, Beirut, Damascus, Amman, Cairo, 
And the opening of these communications would um, enable such a vast development of the region. The, Arab, the arid uh, desert areas could blossom. Um, pilgrims could come from all over the earth. And there could be an incredible intellectual revival. Young Israelis and Arabs would join together to learn. And of course, what um, Heschel is talking about here is the same vision that Isaiah is talking about in his uh, promise that there will be a highway running from Egypt through Israel to um, Syria and Iraq. And may the Lord bring it speedily. Okay, now I want to return now to the Aaronic blessing. And very early in the history of Israel, while they were still at Mount Sinai, the priests were entrusted with the privilege of bestowing God's blessing upon the people. God spoke to Moses to instruct Aaron and his sons with these words. And he said, looking at the um, scripture here, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. So in the priestly benediction, there was power because Aaron was appointed by God himself to bless the people. And when he pronounced the benediction over the multitude, it was not his blessing, but the blessing of God who had sent him. And this is the way in which the priests would bless the people. They would come out of the tabernacle or the temple after the daily offering and line up at the top of the steps. They would lift both arms and they would form the shape of the letter Shin with their hands as so. Um, the first letter of God's name, Shaddai, God Almighty. Now, there are echoes. This beautiful scripture, this beautiful has been, as we talked, it's been read at the end of service in the synagogue, in the temple, in the churches for 3000s of years. And it's a very, very beautiful blessing. And there are echoes of it all throughout the, the scripture. And so we could find hundreds of examples, but the opening words of Psalm 67, uh, we'll look at, and they suggest another dimension of the blessing. And this is how it reads. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. So the prayer for blessing is not simply a favor that one implores for oneself, but is intended to function as a channel for God's revelation and salvation to the nations. Now, when we turn to the New Testament, we find that the significance of the ironic blessing is again magnified. In the threefold utterance of the name of the Lord, the early Christians saw an allusion to the mystery of the Trinity, the thought that God would bestow on his people the fullness of his blessing, which is communicated through Father, Son, and Spirit. And Jesus commenced his ministry with the Sermon on the Mount and the word blessed. His whole life thereafter was a stream of blessing as he turned the light of his countenance upon so many and brought them intimations of grace and favor and love of which they had never dreamed. But it's in Jesus' final appearance on earth reveals the full transcendent meaning of the ironic blessing. At the end of 40 days of his post-resurrection appearances, Jesus led his disciples out to the Mount of Olives. Remember, we were talking about it recently when we looked at Pentecost. And these are the words we read in Luke uh, chapter 24, verse 50. He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. 
In Luke's profound portrait of the ascending Christ, he draws on the imagery of the priestly blessing. Jesus has made the perfect and final sacrifice and secured forgiveness of sins for his people. With the sacrifice completed, as his resurrection testifies, he raises his hands over his people and blesses them. We don't know the exact words he used, but surely it was the substance of the Berakat Kohanim, the priestly blessing. And when the disciples looked at Christ's upraised hands as he blessed them, they could see the nail prints marking his sacrificial death on the cross, which told them something about the cost of bestowing this blessing. As they gazed upon him ascending into heaven, they saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. While they had heard of God's graciousness, now they saw him who is grace incarnate. While they had longed for God's lifted countenance, now they saw it actualized. The great high priest had come and not only pronounced the benediction, but had become the benediction. Now, just before he had ascended, Jesus had told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high. Jesus' blessing and the sending of the Spirit are inseparably connected. And 10 days later, as the disciples prayed, the Holy Spirit fell on them, bestowed by the heavenly Lord. And the Spirit enriched the disciples with so many blessings, gifts of wisdom, utterance, set their hearts aflame with love. From there, they were sent out in all the world, made priests and kings unto God, that they might put his name on others and become bearers of his blessing to them. A question. The Jewish people have paid a huge cost in bringing blessing to the world and have endured much privation and suffering over the past 2,000 years as they were cast aside and entered into national eclipse so that the Gentiles might enter into the Commonwealth of Israel. This is my question. Has the church fulfilled its mandate to be a blessing to all peoples, and most especially to the Jewish people, to whom we owe so much? Have we provoked them to jealousy through our deeds of goodness and love? Or have we not rather, over the centuries, often treated them lightly and with contempt? Did we embrace the arrogance which St. Paul warned us against with such entreaty and tears, as he longed that the Gentiles would show to his brethren the honor they should be accorded. Now, I want to look specifically um, at one group of churches, and that is the World Council of Churches, which is it's an ecumenical movement which represents over 500 million Christians in more than a hundred countries. Now, they have a very noble objective of breaking down barriers and seeking justice and peace. But unfortunately, their activities often take the form of anti-Semitic rhetorical speech or writing or in social action and political maneuvering against the Jewish state. Now, particularly, this the WCC is a promoter of the Kairos Palestine document, representing views of Palestinian Christians who claim Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories and stress the right of return of refugees. Kairos characterizes terrorist armed acts of armed resistance as Palestinian legal resistance, denies Jewish historical connection to Israel in theological terms, compares Israel with the South African apartheid regime and calls churches worldwide to engage in boycott, divestment and sanctions. Now, and also we have a new thing, a new generation of anti-Israel activists and academics are now trying to claim that actually Jesus wasn't just a Jew, but a Palestinian. 
Now, this claim is so, one doesn't have words for the, the historical um, craziness of it, but it's a negation of Jewish history and it's a modern day attempt at replacement theology, questioning the legitimacy of the Jewish connection to the Holy Land while suggesting that Palestinians have ancient roots there. Jesus, of course, was born in Judea. He lived as a Jew and he died as a Jew. Judea was a client kingdom of the Roman Empire. Jesus um, was a Jew among the Jews. Now, the entrance of Arabs to the Holy Land occurred 700 years after Jesus was crucified, when Arab conquerors took the um, area. So history matters. And I am pointing out the World Council of Churches, but, and the palace, but there are many, many mainstream churches that also are guilty of this um, terrible thing called replacement theology. Um, I have another question. And this time it's from Rabbi Sachs. Now, some of you might come, have come across some of his writing. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was a very, very great teacher and a great international leader. He was uh, the chief rabbi of the United Kingdom and he, was, he became a Lord. He was lifted to the House of Lords. Um, he, was, it was, uh, he was a great worker for reconciliation between Jews and Christians, indeed between all peoples. And unfortunately, very sadly, he died several months ago and it is a very great loss. But this is, uh, his writings continue to be very inspiring. He has a question and I've put um, some, uh, some, some of his comments down here. He says, Israel was, is, and will be a tiny nation sur uh, surrounded by great empires that seek its destruction. Its very survival will always be testimony to something profound, the ability of a small people to outlast great powers by the sheer force of its commitment to justice, compassion, and human dignity. He says, the West itself has already gone far down the road of abandoning the Judeo-Christian principles of the sanctity of life and the sacred covenant of marriage. Instead, it places its faith in a series of institutions, none of which can bear the weight of moral guidance, science, technology, the state, the market, and evolutionary biology. So the fateful question returns, can civilization decline be arrested? To which he says, the great prophetic answer is yes. For the prophets taught us that after every exile, there is a return. After every destruction, the ruins can be rebuilt. After every crisis, there can be a rebirth if we have faith in God's faith in us. But he says, the Judeo-Christian ethic will not return until the fracture at its heart is healed. The fracture that is the long estrangement between Christians and Jews, and that has caused so many persecutions and cost so many lives. And I have a third question. To what then do we owe the present fragmentation of the church, our loss of power and our diminishing influence? Could it be that in esteeming the Jewish people lightly, we have cut ourselves off from the source of blessing. When we do not acknowledge that salvation is of the Jews and that all our spiritual privileges have come to us through their faithfulness and sacrifice, our service and witness is diminished and robbed of its full measure of power. But love for Israel and the Jewish people comes not through reason and argument, but by the revelation of the spirit. And God is doing a new thing in the church. He is showing plainly his great love of his ancient people, his faithfulness to his promises to them, as well as the centrality of Israel in his continuing plan of redemption. The gospels make evident there is a sacrificial dimension involved in bestowing the blessing. And he is calling the Gentile, the Gentile church, to reach out in humility, meekness of heart, to show love, acceptance, honor to the Jews in Israel and the nations. So let's take our place as partners with God and Israel as God continues to fulfill his ancient promises and brings about a longed for final redemption. 
And I want to close with another poem by Yehuda Halevi called Jerusalem. Beautiful heights, city of a great king, from the western coast, my desire burns towards thee. Pity and tenderness burst in me, remembering thy former glories, thy temple now broken stones. I wish I could fly to thee on the wings of an eagle and mingle my tears with thy dust. I have sought thee, love, though the king is not there. And instead of Gilead's balm, snakes and scorpions, let me fall on thy broken stones and tenderly kiss them. The taste of thy dust will be sweeter than honey to me. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, everyone.